Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium, episode 193, Manzikert. We have arrived. We've reached one of the major milestones in Byzantine history. The Battle of Manzikert is one of those few events which people outside of our community have heard of. As time passed, the battle came to be seen as ever more important. The moment when Byzantium began to fall, the moment when the Turks arrived in Turkey, two wider thoughts, the the moment when an Islamic society defeated a Christian one and began to imperil the pilgrimage route to the Holy Land, or even wider still, the beginning of the end for a European civilization that had lived in Asia for a millennium. The battle has come to be seen as many different things across time. For us, with our Byzantine-centric narrative perspective, it's less instantly decisive and cataclysmic, but to use our analogy of the boulder which the Romans have been pushing up the hill This is the moment when the boulder tips over the edge again. With every passing year after man's occurred, the avalanche picks up pace until it reaches the very bottom. The obvious comparison point from the podcast's perspective is with Heraclius' campaigns against the Sassanids and Arabs. In preparing for this extra-long show, my mind has been turned back towards episode 46, The Last War. Heraclius was a lonely figure. Faced with doom, he campaigned relentlessly in the mountains until he could find a way to reverse what had been lost. Today, we follow a similar character. Romanos Theogenes will fight to the bitter end to put a stop to Turkic raiding and like Heraclius, he will ultimately be disappointed. The similarities are easy to consider. What struck me as quite different about the two events was the build-up. Looking back to the 7th century, we had four episodes of incident and calamity leading toward that final confrontation. The Romans and Sassanids were at war on and off for over 20 years, By the time we got to episode 46, we all knew a big, dramatic confrontation was at hand. This time, it doesn't feel like something epic is in the offing. Turkish nomads have done some damage, and the Seljuk takeover of the Caliphate sounds dangerous. But it's all quite distant. Annie has barely featured in our podcast, It's deep enough into Armenia that it hasn't concerned us before, so why should its fall seem like a harbinger of disaster? It's hardly on the same level as Syria, Palestine, and Egypt being conquered by Kusra II. I think that absence of build-up tells us a lot about why this battle took place and why its aftermath was so damaging. The fact that the Romans didn't see this coming is part of the problem. The fact that they didn't fully appreciate how significant the defeat was after the fact is part of the problem. Heraclius had plenty of time to get used to the idea that he was facing a true uphill struggle. Thanks to their snobbery and insularity, our 11th century Byzantines don't seem to have realised that the boulder had started to move until it was too late to stop. That insularity has been easy to chart. Last century, our narrative took place as much on the frontiers as it did in the palace. Nicephorus' focus was in Crete or Cilicia, Basil II was in Bulgaria or Armenia. The empire was facing outward, expanding and experimenting. This past 50 years has been incredibly court-centric, Romanos Ahiros visited Syria 
early on for a failed campaign against Aleppo. And then, nothing. No emperor visited the frontiers for another 29 years. Isaac Komnenos marched to Sadika in 1059 and seemed set to spend his reign returning martial vigour to the office of Vasilevs. But his early death left Constantine Ducas in power, and inexplicably he stayed in the capital as raids on the east became more serious. Ducas's inactivity for the past seven years has allowed the position of the eastern armies to atrophy. Their pay has fallen, their morale and discipline have decayed. The Romans are now in poor shape and quite unprepared to deal with a sudden intensification of raiding, which is what we will see today. As for snobbery, it seems to me that the Romans just couldn't shake their belief, deep down, that those who lived the nomadic lifestyle were beneath contempt. As we've seen, the most damaging warfare in the past half-century was against the Pechenegs. The Romans suffered defeat after defeat after defeat during that conflict. Only their ability to keep recruiting more men to throw at the nomads forced through a peace settlement. That should have set alarm bells ringing. Those battles took place 20 years after Basil II's last campaigns, and it showed... The Romans were rusty and poorly led. Confronted by the hail of arrows from Pechenegg bows, Byzantine troops turned and fled, instead of standing their ground, trusting that their commander would find a solution. After this anemic response, little was done to rearrange the empire's strategic priorities. When it became clear that Turkic nomads, armed with the same weaponry, had settled along the eastern border, there should have been a revolution in military thinking. Instead, the Game of Thrones continued in Constantinople. The fact that steppe nomads rarely form states seems to be the comfort blanket which successive emperors huddled under. This, then, is what we will cover today. How, in just a four-year period, the Roman world went from seemingly peaceful superpower to a state capable of of rapid collapse. Last time, we were left feeling blank by the reign of Constantine X. Ducas was supposed to be another general taking charge of the throne. We expected him to continue the work begun by his friend Isaac Komnenos, an attempt to restore the pay and discipline of the army. But instead, Ducas behaved like most of the civilian emperors we've dealt with this century. He stayed at home, he kept the urban elites happy, and he tolerated damaging raids across the eastern border. The only time when we're sure that Ducas exerted himself was, ironically, on his deathbed. Leaving behind him a gaggle of young children, the emperor made his wife swear, on pain of death, that she would not marry again. Of course, we understand the desire of a father to protect his children's inheritance, but from an imperial point of view, Ducas was asking his wife not to allow a competent general to take charge of the empire, but instead to maintain his passive civilian regime until one of his sons could take over. Turkic raids be damned. It's interesting to note that the emperor did have a competent brother. John Ducas had already governed cities and commanded troops, but no one seems to suggest that perhaps John, who already had the rank of Caesar, might take the reins of government until his nephew was ready for the responsibility. One thing the Byzantines understood pretty well was that absolute power corrupts. John Ducas had sons of his own, Clearly, it was felt that he could not be trusted with imperial responsibility. Once he heard his name cheered by 20,000 people, how long until he pushed aside his brother's family in favour of his own? So, that left Evthokia Macremvolitisa in charge of the Roman Empire. It was late May 1067, 
and recent precedent meant that there was no great objection to a woman ruling alone. But two things happened that summer that convinced the Empress that she needed an imperial partner. The first was a plot hatched in the Balkans to unseat her. Given the insecurity surrounding the throne, Ducas's death naturally set tongues wagging. One of those who thought about seizing the throne was Romanos Theogenes, the Dukes of Serdica. You may remember two episodes ago, Isaac Komnenos had marched to Serdica to deal with conflict between the neighbouring kingdom of Hungary and the Pechenegs who lived north of the Hemus Mountains. Naturally, Romanus, as Dukes of Serdica, had been heavily involved in discussions with the Hungarians. Now it seemed, Romanus planned to make an alliance with the former Magyars. He would use their troops to storm the walls of Constantinople and become emperor. This plot was uncovered by fellow officers at Serdica, and Romanus was arrested and dragged in shame to the capital. There, the Empress sat in judgment over the rebel and sentenced him to death, commuted to exile thanks to the mercy of a good Christian ruler. Amongst the legal experts advising Evdokia was Michael Ataliates, one of our historians and eyewitness to the events you'll hear about today. The second event that took place that summer was a devastating raid into Anatolia itself. The Seljuks were on the move across the Eastern Front. The Sultan, Alp Arslan, returned to Georgia to enforce his suzerainty over various mountain lords, while one of his lieutenants in Syria made a vigorous attempt to take Edessa from the Romans. Then a raiding party, led by the Turkish general Afshin, broke through onto the plateau. The march of the nomads was met by the garrison at Melitene, but with morale already low, the troops fled under steady arrow fire from the Turks. With the path clear, Afshin led his men to Caesarea, the largest city in Cappadocia, and sacked it. As if this wasn't bad enough, Afshin then chose to return home through Cilicia. As you know, Cilicia had for centuries been the battleground between caliphate and empire. Roman defences in the area were all facing east, so to speak. Afshin's raid took the locals completely by surprise, causing devastation and allowing the nomads to drag loot and slaves away in their wake. According to Ataliates, the local garrisons were also disaffected by their low pay and imperial inattention. A few officers even defected to the Seljuk banner. The victorious Turks swaggered past Antioch and headed for Aleppo, which had by this time become a Seljuk vassal. There, Afshin unloaded his bounty, received reinforcements, and headed back to Antioch, looting the countryside and daring the Romans to do something about it. Again, Ataliates claims that the garrison of Antioch were underpaid and refused to engage with the enemy. It's difficult to know exactly what was going on with the soldiers of the east. It may just be that Afshin's force was too large to confront, though stories of dissatisfaction fits with our general impression of Ducas's reign. With news that a truly Byzantine city had been sacked and that Turkic raids had met with no resistance, the Empress realised that she could no longer rule alone. The Empire desperately needed a capable military leader, and it really needed a martial emperor, someone with the power to actually make changes and coordinate defence across the whole frontier. Politically, this couldn't be left to an independent general. If he was successful, he would surely seize the throne. Evthokia understood that she needed to break the solemn vow she'd made and marry a general herself. Only then could she empower a capable individual without endangering her children's safety. There were many eligible generals serving the empire at that moment, but the empress had her eye on one in particular, a man currently languishing in the capital's 
jail. Romanos Theogenes was born around 1030 to a military family from Cappadocia. His father had served with Basil II in the Balkans before being caught up in a conspiracy to overthrow Romanos Archiros. No lingering stain had attached to his son, who rose to be an army commander in his twenties, eventually coming to serve along the Danube, and now in his mid-thirties, promoted to being the Dukes of Serdica. For those of you who've read about Manzikert before, you've probably read his name as Romanos Diogenes, or Romanos Diogenes. We lose the D and G in Greek and get Theogenes. Romanos had impressed friend and foe alike in his dealings with the various protagonists of the northern Balkans, and the fact that he was handsome and well-built didn't hurt his chances once he was in front of the empress. Now, that might sound unworthy of me to imply, but if you're going to bring someone into court from nowhere to become the Vasilevs, then having a leading man's look was genuinely helpful. Romanos and Evtokia will then have two children together, fueling suggestions that the empress, given the choice, went for handsome and capable, above simply capable. The fact that Romanus was on death row may also have been key to the Empress's decision-making. Evthokia was considering a pretty selfless decision, the kind that few men, Basil II included, had been willing to make. She was risking her life by empowering someone else for the good of the Empire. Once she made Romanus into the Vasilevs, she knew she would no longer be able to control him. He could well end up disempowering her and disinheriting her children. So ideally, she would appoint someone who she had some kind of leverage over. In this scenario, Romanus would rule thanks to her munificence. He had been condemned in front of the court as a traitor. She could have executed him. But instead, she would marry him. Romanos was to understand that he owed her his life and must repay that kindness by serving her diligently. Supporting this theory are the first coins issued after their marriage, which show her as the senior figure. Despite the logic and self-sacrifice of her choice, both Psellos and Ataliates claim that they were against it at the time. Doubtless many men were, in part because they'd all sworn not to let her remarry, but also because everyone knew the complications that would ensue from this union. The Macedonian dynasty was very fortunate with the protectors who entered the palace during their time. Romanos Lecapinos, Nicephorus Phocas, John Zemiskis, none displaced the Macedonians, and none of them had born in the purple children. In fact, as we talked about at the time, it's possible that Basil II's mother didn't really sleep with Nicephorus, despite marrying him. This ensured that no true-born rivals would threaten the succession. Here, the exact problem which Constantine Ducas foresaw came to pass. Evthokia gave birth to two boys, both born in the purple. Who was the new Emperor Romanos going to favour, his own children or the sons of his predecessor? This was one of the reasons that the Church frowned so much on remarriage. It created complications and disagreements over the inheritance, which in this case was the Empire itself. Theogenes already had a son from a previous marriage to throw into the mix. That sound indicates the passing of a year, in this case 1067 into 1068. On January the 1st, 1068, Romanos Theogenes became the emperor Romanos the 4th. The leading members of the court had been convinced to break their oaths once reports of the destruction at Caesarea had been fully absorbed. The one holdout, understandably, was the Caesar. 
John Dukas. Not only did he lose influence in this scenario, but it put him in a dangerous position. If someone were to fabricate a report that he was plotting against the Crown, it would be widely believed. The teenage emperor, Michael, Constantine Dukas' eldest son, was also in danger from the new appointment. As I've mentioned before, he's widely described as passive and bookish. And Salos gives us the extraordinary story that his mother never consulted him about her decision. She actually just woke him up one morning and instructed him to greet his soon-to-be father-in-law. Which Michael, like a lamb, did. He even told the Varangian guard to stand down when they objected to a new emperor being brought in ahead of him. Our historian, Salos, is by this point Michael's tutor and confidant, and so can't say anything bad about the young man. But you can't help but see sarcasm in his fulsome praise for the boy's willingness to accept these decisions being made behind his back, given that the rest of the chronographia praises emperors who took no guff from anyone. The time for court intrigue, though, is over. Romanus had been elevated to do a job, and it was time he got going. As soon as spring appeared, Theogenes left the capital and began calling up army units to join him on the road to the eastern front. To ensure that the Ducas clan remained docile while he was gone, he took the eight-year-old Andronicus Ducas with him, officially to give him some experience of the real world, unofficially as a hostage. Romanos made his way to the Anatolikon and called upon the theme troops to gather. Michael Ataliates was present in the role of military judge and witnessed the army coalescing. It's worth saying that marching with the emperor were several elite regiments, Tachmata from east and west, along with Pechenegs hired for the campaign. But it was the sight of the local levies that Ataliates chose to comment on. In a famous passage, he wrote of his pity at seeing the once great Anatolikon theme gathering, bent over by poverty, ill-equipped and ill-prepared for the rigours of war. As we talked about last time, Ataliates is mounting a defence of Romanos. When the emperor loses at Manzikert, the Ducai will lay the blame for defeat squarely at his door. So here, Ataliates argues that it was Constantine X who deprived the army of money, just when they needed it. It's hard for us to know the truth, but we should remember that thematic troops across the empire had long been inactive. Nicephorus Phocas and others had preferred fully professional cavalry, either foreign or domestic, for wars of conquest. Part-time soldiers were only used as infantry to provide a shield for the horsemen. So it's possible Ataliates really did see sorry-looking men approaching the emperor's camp, but that is sort of what we'd expect to hear. The Vasilevs sent recruiters out into the provinces with cash to fetch new soldiers and spent the early summer training them. Meanwhile, two Turkic raiding parties were operating in Roman territory. We'll talk a little more about what was going on in the Seljuk realm later, but it's safe to say that since the fall of Ani four years earlier, the nomads had seen a green light on the roads into Romania. Within the Sultanate too, this was a period of internal peace, so the steppe riders who had settled along the border, both with Armenia and Syria, now had license to plunder Byzantium at will. One group were operating in Syria that summer, while the other had moved past Theodosiopolis into the theme of Chaldea in northeast Anatolia. The emperor wanted more time with his soldiers, but news then came that the northern raiders had sacked the city of Neo Caesarea in the Armenia Khan. Romanos decided to break off a portion of his army and chase them down. Given he'd been appointed to deal with this crisis, he had to be seen to act when a city 
had been attacked. But Theo Yenis also showed military acumen by choosing this moment to go after the raiders. It goes without saying that the nomads were better horsemen than even the finest Byzantine cavalry officer, but it was the light weight of the steppe riders that made their raids so hard to catch. Imperial cavalry had to carry their panoply of weapons and armour along with food and other supplies, whereas the nomads, armed with just their bow and a sword, could race across the plains at uncatchable speeds. Now, the Turks would be weighed down by the slaves and possessions they'd taken. Leaving his fresh recruits to continue their training, Theogenes led his elite cavalry in a rapid pursuit of the enemy. He stopped at Sebastea to receive updates on their movements and ditch his baggage. For the next eight days, the emperor rode as fast as he could, finally catching sight of the nomads near to Friki. Italiates tells us that the nomads outnumbered the Romans comfortably, but that didn't matter. It was simply surprise which won the day. The Turks had not expected any resistance, and the sudden appearance of the emperor caused panic. The men from the steppes abandoned much of their loot as they raced to get out of Dodge. The Byzantines picked off the stragglers and recovered much of what was taken from Neo Caesarea. It was an important morale boost for Romanos and his men, but it was not what he'd come east to achieve. So after only three days' rest, Theogenes gave the order to move, and his cavalry headed for Syria. Wisely avoiding the height of summer, the Romans descended into Syria in late October. The whole army had now assembled, with a small force broken off to guard the route to Melitene. A large imperial army had not come to this frontier for decades, and the Seljuks had by now flipped Aleppo, injecting themselves into the endless tug-of-war for control of the city. As we saw in the raids of 1067, this allowed the local Turks to do tremendous damage to the countryside which supported Antioch. Humans and livestock alike had been dragged off to Aleppo's markets. Romanos needed to reassert control. He led the army to the city of Manbij, or Hieropolis as it was once known. It was the largest town in between Antioch and Aleppo, and it was quickly captured by the imperial army. But inside the walls was a high and inaccessible citadel. The Muslim garrison locked the gates and refused to abandon their positions. Romanos left some of the Takmata outside the city to keep an eye out, while he besieged the citadel's high towers. At this point, the forces of Aleppo and their Seljuk allies appeared outside the city and quickly defeated the Byzantine cavalry. As was so often the case, the hail of arrows which the nomads rained down upon the Takmata quickly broke their nerve. Romanos was called to the gates and was angry to discover how quickly his troops had turned tail. The emperor was now besieged during his own siege of the citadel. The enemy spent the night making noise to try and break the morale of the imperial force. But next morning, November 20th, with no fanfare, the emperor led his entire army out of the city in good order. The Muslim force attacked, but they were outnumbered and outgunned. When they fled, Romanos quickly gave the order to cease the pursuit. He had no interest in losing men in the chase. He had what he wanted. The garrison in the citadel surrendered. The emperor installed his own soldiers and headed home. It had been a successful campaign in spite of the sack of Neo Caesarea. Antioch had been reinforced, and the Turks now knew, finally, that the Byzantines were going to try and stop them. When it came to pitched battles, a full Roman field army could still intimidate, and Romanus had proven to be a capable leader under pressure. But as the army moved through Cilicia, disastrous news reached them 
the force that the emperor had sent to Melitine had failed in their task. They too had been dispersed by a shower of arrows, and another Turkic raid had entered Anatolia. They were led by Afshin, the man who'd sacked Caesarea. Finding Anatolia undefended, he had dashed across the plateau and sacked Amorium, the headquarters of the Anatolicon. It's quite an emotive choice from our point of view. During the dark days of Arab raids, Amorium was one of the centres of Byzantine resistance, and its sack in 838 was the last full caliphal assault on Byzantium. Though its walls had been rebuilt, the city was no longer the fortress it had been back in the ninth century. Its sack was therefore not a strategic blow to the empire, but symbolically, it tells us all we need to know about the strength of the Seljuk realm. While a full Roman field army was on the move, the Turks could just nip in the back door and destroy a whole city. Romanus had done little wrong. He'd been sensible to focus on the border defences, but politically, this was very damaging. Back in Constantinople, the news that two cities were sacked while the emperor was present would be fuel for his rivals. The nuances of his success were likely lost in translation. The emperor didn't arrive home until January 1069, and the court made the most of his success. Psellos wrote panegyrics about Romanus's victories, and Theogenes and the empress conceived their first child, a boy named Leo. Theogenes also tried to find allies at court by promoting the interests of the Komnenos family. As you know, Isaac Komnenos had handed the reins of government to his friend Constantine Ducas rather than start a family dynasty. Isaac's family were left hanging around at court as a sort of junior branch of the imperial family. The Ducai looked after them, but had no interest in making them seem of equal status. To strengthen his position, Romanos did exactly that. He promoted Manuel Komnenos, Isaac's nephew, to be a senior army commander, and arranged for his eldest son to marry Manuel's sister. As you probably know, this branch of the Komnenos family will end up in power not long from now, and it's partly because of this that we have favourable accounts of the life of Romanos Theogenes. If the Ducas clan had reigned supreme, then Romanus's reputation would have been mud. By spring, Romanus was keen to get back to the borderlands. But as he was saddling up, news came of a Norman rebellion within Anatolia. In the past few episodes, we've briefly touched on the contingents of Normans stationed on the frontiers. In particular, we focused on the figure of Hervé Frangopoulos, who was eventually executed for conspiring with the Turks. Across the centuries, men from many nations came to Constantinople, offering to fight for pay. Most came without a network of their own, and so served loyally, gratefully accepting the valuable gold coins, which if they survived would make them rich back home. The Normans were different. As you know, the Vikings who established a colony in Normandy learnt a very different lesson from serving the French king. Rather than obey the crown in exchange for cash, they occupied and stole and later had those gains legalised. The same pattern played out in Italy. The Normans turned from mercenaries to conquerors when it became clear that the Byzantines weren't sending reinforcements to stop them. One minute they were the Pope's sworn enemies, the next they were holy warriors retaking Sicily in the name of St. Peter's heir. So when Hervé's pay was late, he threw in his lot with the Turks, raiding his land, to make sure that he and his men got theirs. Sure enough, his illegal behaviour was rewarded once the Byzantines were in trouble. They reappointed Hervé to his command post, 
despite his treachery. Hervé did eventually fall foul of the authorities, but presumably some of his men survived his death to encourage new recruits from the West that their rapacious tactics would work just as well in Anatolia as they had elsewhere. Enter Roger Crepin. Crepin was another experienced Norman commander. He'd served in Spain and Italy before being hired to take command of the Normans settled in the Armeniacon theme. Crepin believed that he had not been paid what he was owed, or at least that that was the excuse he gave. Certainly, money was tight, so he seized his theme's taxes and distributed them to his men. Furious at this, Romanos dispatched most of the western Tachmata to take him down. But Crepin was a master of Norman heavy cavalry tactics, engaged the Byzantines directly, and defeated them. This was an ominous moment for Romanos, though he didn't know it yet. The emperor was at Dorylaeum, the first staging post on the road east, gathering another field army. It's not clear what Crepin hoped to achieve, because once he realized that the emperor was marching east, he rode to him and offered his submission. He was imprisoned for his trouble, but we will be hearing from him again. His unit, by the way, went plundering in Mesopotamia and had to be chased down. Romanus shook off this irritation and headed for the frontier. Again, news reached him that Turkic warbands had crossed the borders and were attacking the countryside. The Vasilevs repeated the tactics of the previous summer. He chased one group around Sebastea and drove them off, then he moved against Afshin, who had reached Melitene. The Turks retreated, and the emperor let them go. He left a portion of his army behind to defend Melitene, while he moved north, hoping to reach Lake Van, where he aimed to repair imperial defences, securing, ideally, the fortress cities of Manzikert and Kliat. But no sooner had the emperor reached the other side of the Taurus Mountains that news reached him of commotion to his rear. In his absence, Afshin had returned and assaulted the smaller force he'd left at Melitene. Once again, under the storm of arrows, the Romans had been defeated and the Turks had broken through into Anatolia. The emperor couldn't chase them. His troops were vulnerable in the mountain passes and supplies were hard to come by. Ataliates was on hand to witness all this. He says that the Turks had ravaged the land, and so it couldn't easily sustain a large army. He also says that the emperor was keen to rescue the survivors from the battle at Melitene, who were trickling through the passes towards him. He says specifically that if these men wandered alone for too long, they were likely to be killed by the locals. The locals, by the way, were largely Christian Armenians but Ataliates was in no doubt that soldiers lost in the mountains would be murdered for their gear. It's an anecdote that neatly sums up all I've been trying to explain about the true nature of Roman control in the borderlands. The emperor gathered up his army and marched them carefully back to Sebastea. He lost no more men, but he was also unable to stop Afshin. The Turkish commander led his force across the unguarded plateau and sacked yet another city, this time Iconium in the Anatolikon. As Antony Caldellis puts it, Afshin was methodically picking off the unspoiled and rich cities of Roman Asia Minor. These cities had long forgotten about the Arab raids that dried up a century ago. They'd become wealthy trade hubs for the farmers and herders of Anatolia, now they were intensely vulnerable. In some ways, these raids were worse than those of the victorious Arabs from centuries before, because the nomads were so quick and so experienced at using steppe conditions, which is exactly what they found on the wide Anatolian plateau. Byzantium was completely unprepared for this shift in the strategic sands. Here, Romanos and a full field army were only a hundred miles or so away from the raiders when they crossed the border, but there was nothing they could do about them, 
The army, with its foot soldiers and wagons full of supplies, could move no quicker. And Theogenes and the cavalry could not abandon them in the mountain passes or risk them falling into chaos. The Roman response was slow and sluggish, like a giant waving its huge arms ineffectually at smaller, quicker opponents snapping at its heels. And yet, what could Romanos do? Every time he broke his army up, the smaller part was attacked and defeated. He had to keep a central field army together. It was the only defense the empire had against these raids. But as another city went up in flames, it was becoming apparent that even Byzantium's best defense might not be good enough. The emperor did try to hit Afshin as he returned home with his loot, he sent units to Antioch to warn his dukes there, Chatatorius, of what was coming. And Roman troops did ambush the Turkic column as it passed through Cilicia, forcing Afshin to abandon many of the goods he was carting back to Aleppo. But the emperor had hoped that Chatatorius would now launch a full-scale attack with the garrison of Antioch, which could have wiped the raiding party out. But he didn't. Without the emperor's presence, Byzantine officers seemed reluctant to engage with the horse archers. Chatatorius's caution allowed Afshin to shepherd his men back to safety. I have to admit that it was at this point during my research that I became quite irritated by both Psellos and Ataliates. I know that you know that Roman history writing is not an exercise in presenting the unvarnished truth, but usually our writers are long removed from the events they're putting a spin on. Here, we have two eyewitnesses blatantly lying to avoid being tarnished themselves by the defeat at Manzikert. Psellos claims that Theogenes was doing all this for his own glory, which is ridiculous, but in a way I'm more forgiving of him because he was now part of the Ducas regime, so what else could he say? Ataliates' report, though, really grates. He is sympathetic to Romanus, and is arguing that Theogenes was trying his best to defend the empire, but with no shame at all. Ataliates inserts half a dozen occasions where he disagreed with the emperor's strategy, each one an occasion where, if his advice had been followed, the Romans might well have destroyed the Turks and never had to confront them at Manzikert. I should remind you that Ataliates was a jurist. He was on campaign to act as a judge when military courts had to convene. He had no campaign experience to speak of. So it feels doubly annoying to hear him, with hindsight, claiming that he told Romanos to pursue Afshin all the way to Aleppo. It's both bad advice and utterly transparent. Now, it probably reveals more about me than our historians that it annoyed me so much, but again we confront the insularity that pervades the Byzantine response to the Turks. Preserving one's position at court was more important than trying to create a winning military response. <laughs> Speaking of preserving one's position at court, Romanos decided not to campaign in person during 1070. He may have sensed agitation amongst the Ducas clan and reasoned that he couldn't be everywhere at once, so it was time to empower another general. Theogenes also spent time with his infant son, as well as conceiving another born that year named Nicephorus. John Ducas, the obvious rival for Romanus's position, withdrew from the capital and spent the year on his Bithynian estates. As I mentioned earlier, Romanus lent on the Komni Noi to help create an imperial coalition, so he sent the army out with Manuel Komnenos in charge. Emmanuel's younger brother, Alexios, that Alexios, uh, was still in his teens. The results of that year's campaign were the same, if not worse, than the previous two. Manuel divided the army, since the Turks were again attacking on multiple fronts. One portion headed for Manbij, where the forces of Aleppo were trying to retake the city. They succeeded in lifting the siege, but could do little else. 
Meanwhile, Manuel headed for Sebastea, where a Turkic force met him head on. Manuel seems to have fallen for that step classic, the feigned retreat. As he pursued his fleeing enemy, the Turks wheeled around and attacked. Many died. The rest were able to make it to the safety of Sebastea's walls, but Manuel was captured. Another omen for Romanus's fate. A third Turkic group, under Afshin's leadership, took this opportunity to race across the now undefended frontier to look for more low-hanging fruit. They found some at Konai, a city famous for its shrine of the Archangel Gabriel. For those of you not near a map, Konai is on the very western tip of the plateau, not that far from Ephesus on the coast. The Turks were moving with impunity deep into Roman territory. Back at Sebastea, Manuel was brought before the Turkic chieftain, who we know as Eriskin. Despite his victory, Eriskin revealed that he had fallen out with Alp Arslan. He was one of the Sultan's brothers-in-law, but in the competitive politics of the Seljuk realm, he'd become an unwanted rival for power. Manuel offered to take him to Constantinople and ensure he was put on the payroll, and Eriskin accepted. The two arrived at court to much excitement, but little seems to have come from it. Presumably, some of Eriskin's men headed home, and if he did provide the Romans with valuable intelligence, it made little difference to the final result. The courteous diplomacy offered to captured nobles on both sides, though, is worth noting. Responding to the never-ending forays into Anatolia, Romanos had some forts rebuilt. Tellingly, the two we know of for certain guarded passes from the plateau down to the Mediterranean coast. Theoyenes was preparing Romania to return to the strategic situation it had faced during the centuries of the Caliphate. The emperor was not done trying to fix this problem directly, though. He wanted to make another attempt to reinforce the Armenian border around Lake Van. This was a key dual entry point for Turkic raids, as we'll discuss when the Romans get there. But Romanos knew that in order to successfully invest and capture the fortresses, he would need overwhelming numerical superiority. That would mean dragging the whole army, plus mercenaries, deep into the mountains, where they would need extra supplies to survive, and they could be gone for some time. In order to afford such a campaign, Theoyenes took the step that his predecessors had been fighting hard to avoid ever since Monomachos had first done it 25 years earlier. He increased the debasement of the gold coinage. The Vasilevs reduced the gold content in his nomismata from 87 to 70%. That allowed him to mint enough coins to pay for the campaign, but everyone involved knew that this was a risk. Soldiers' pay was forcibly reduced, just as you were asking them to campaign harder than before, and the tax take that would return would now be inherently less valuable. But the can had been kicked too far down the road at this point. Romanos felt he had to land some punches on the Turks if he was going to survive politically, let alone survive their physical onslaught. His decision-making was made more urgent by news that the Sultan himself was operating on the frontiers that winter, and here is where we need to turn our perspective east for a short while. By now you should be familiar with the broad strokes of life in the former caliphate. The constituent parts of the Islamic world had torn apart the unity which the Abbasids had once commanded. Egypt, Iraq, Iran, Khorasan, all could effectively provide power bases for local warlords, and these centrifugal tendencies had kept the Middle East divided during the past two centuries. But change came when the Samanid dynasty of northern Iran fell, and with them the dam holding back the steppes. Waves of Turkic-speaking tribes moved south into Iran and spread out from there. Some worked as mercenaries or private armies for the settled societies. Some remained free and simply followed the grasslands west. 
It was a process with some similarity to the waves of Goths, Vandals, and Franks who spread out across the Western Roman Empire in the 5th century. But no emperor arose from amongst those migrants to create a new Germanized Roman Empire, whereas in the 11th century Islamic world, the Seljuks did exactly that. As the Seljuk coalition grew, its leadership quickly realized that the way to unite the largest number of settled peoples behind their cause was to espouse the cause of Sunni Islam and revive the spirit, if not the exact institutions, of the caliphate. This was no simple matter. Many in Iran and elsewhere were Shiites or followers of other sects, and as with most tribal confederations, succession was hotly disputed between the leading men of the state. Each new sultan had to fight off relatives and rivals to ensure that he maintained control of this giant empire. As with the early years of the Arab Caliphate, it's not easy to write a history of such a chaotic process. All we need to know, though, is that the sultans had to be continuously on campaign against both internal threats and external enemies. We saw this clearly with the attack on Ani. Controlling Armenia was a peripheral concern to the Seljuks, but controlling the tribes who'd settled in Azerbaijan was of prime importance. Therefore, Alp Arslan captured the city, securing the grasslands around Ani for his followers, while also demonstrating the strength necessary to cow them. It's hard to reconstruct the Sultan's motives during this period. Our lack of Seljuk sources mean there isn't even a modern biography of Alp Arslan to consult, but according to historian Michael Brett, the Sultan's behaviour indicates that he was actually fighting against expansion of his realm in certain directions. He was happy to seek peace treaties with eastern and western neighbours, in large part so that he could maintain control of the nomads. The one direction where confrontation was inevitable was to the south. As we just talked about, the Seljuks had sought the support of the Caliph, still the supreme religious authority for the majority of Muslims. Like Charlemagne arriving in Rome, the Sultan had entered Baghdad in 1055 to secure this important blessing. This, however, provoked a response from the other caliphate in town. Down in Cairo, the Fatimid project had stalled somewhat since running into the twin barriers of Basil II and the desert which separated Iraq from Syria. As a Shia sect, the Fatimids hoped to use the Byzantines as a rallying point to unite Sunnis with their cause. But Basil's solid defense of Antioch and refusal to push things further scuppered momentum. Meanwhile, the tribes who dominated the deserts of the area were not easily coerced by the Fatimids, blocking the path to Baghdad. This left the Fatimids in control of Egypt and parts of Syria and Palestine, but no more. The Seljuk advance presented an ideological challenge. Both sides were claiming to speak for all Muslims. War was inevitable, and at this rate it looked like there would be only one winner. Cairo was deep in a political and economic crisis, just as the Seljuks were growing in strength. We don't have space to go into detail, but conflict between army factions, between the army and bureaucracy, and famine provoked by grain speculation, all enfeebled the state, just as Alp Arslan had freed himself of domestic concerns. So it was that in the winter of 1069, the Sultan made plans to march on Syria and see just how much of the Fatimid realm he could peel off while they were preoccupied. In order to get there, though, Alp Arslan knew that he had to contend with Byzantium. Alp Arslan, by the way, is not a personal name. It's an epithet, meaning valiant lion in Persian. The sultan's real name was Muhammad bin Dawad Chagri. In order to march safely through Syria, 
he needed to know that the Romans would be preoccupied in their borderlands. So, in order to protect the position of his supporters, the Sultan began his march south by going past Lake Van. Arriving in the area in September 1070, the Sultan's large army besieged and captured the cities of Manzikert and Arkesh. He then passed by the key fortress of Kliat, already held by an allied garrison, and crossed south into Mesopotamia. If you have time to look at the main map stored on the maps page at thehistoryofbyzantium.com, you'll see why this was such a key location. To the north of Lake Van was the central route through Armenia into Anatolia, but to the south, past Kliat, was a key mountain pass leading down into Mesopotamia and the river valleys that would take you to Baghdad in one direction and Aleppo in the other. This was one of the routes Heraclius used during his wars with the Sassanids. And more pertinently, it was the route that had allowed Afshin to repeatedly outmaneuver imperial defences and do so much damage. This is why the fortresses on the lake were such a pivotal location for both sides. The Seljuks had known this for a long time. You may remember that back in 1054, Arslan's predecessor, Tugrul Beg, had attempted to capture Manzikert. He'd failed, and he'd been unable to follow up this attack, but it should have been a warning to the Romans that the area needed more attention. They seemed to have done nothing about it, and would very soon regret it. After securing the area, Alp Arslan moved his army south and received submission from the Marwanids, one-time Roman clients who controlled much of the surrounding area. Then he assaulted the Byzantine outpost of Edessa. Jutting out into Mesopotamia, the city was a potential source of trouble for the Sultan if he turned his back on it. However, despite capturing some supporting fortresses, the city itself held out. Its walls were sturdy, and its Byzantine garrison resisted stoutly. As 1071 dawned, Romanus received reports of all this, and continued to plan his own expedition to the area to reverse the situation. Alparslan eventually abandoned the siege of Edessa for a promise of tribute, and moved on to Aleppo. As you know, Aleppo was the swing city of Syria, caught between the magnetic poles of Constantinople, Cairo, and Baghdad. The city maintained a precarious and hotly contested independence for the past century or so. Though the ruling dynasty had wisely pledged itself to the Seljuks, when Alp Arslan arrived and demanded to see the emir, he was refused. The sultan wanted the ruler of Aleppo to come out of the city and make a formal act of submission to him. But, we assume, the emir felt that to be seen as the sultan's lapdog in front of the whole city was a humiliation that would undermine him, and so he demurred. It's interesting to think that had Aleppo meekly submitted, as might have been expected, the Battle of Manzikert would never have taken place. Instead, Arslan was forced to besiege the city in order to get what he wanted. As the caliph's right hand, he could not easily endure disobedience, nor could he march against the Fatimids without fully securing Aleppo's support. The result of all this was that the Seljuk army was still camped outside Aleppo in May, by which time news of the Byzantine advance had reached them. Two months earlier, Romanos had left the palace after distributing the debased coins to the court and army. Manuel Komnenos died of an illness en route, one of many bad omens which the sources are keen to point out from hindsight. The emperor moved across Anatolia to Caesarea, gathering army units as he went. He'd brought with him the western Tachmata, along with Bulgarian troops and Pechenegs and Ogus Turks, hired for this campaign. They were joined by the eastern Tachmata, eastern thematic troops, Armenian infantry recruited locally, and the Norman contingent stationed in the Armenia Khan, 
under their new commander, Roussel. Estimates for the size of this force has been a topic of scholarly debate for centuries, but the modern consensus rests around 40,000 men. It certainly seems like the largest force assembled since the days of Nicephorus Phocas. At some point during the long march east, messengers arrived at Romanus's tent to tell him that Italy was Byzantine no more. The Normans, who had been besieging Bari for three years now, had finally captured the city. There was nothing the Vasilevs could do about that right now, so he sighed and marched on. On a road beyond Sebastea, the army encountered the rotting corpses of those who'd fallen the year before under Manuel Komnenos's command, adding to Ataliates' sense of foreboding. Our judge was again on hand for the battle, though we now have another Byzantine account of what comes next, written by Nicephorus Vrienios. Vrienios was the husband of fellow history writer Anna Komnini, uh, but was only about nine years old when the battle took place. The reason his account is given credence is that his grandfather, of the same name, will play a key part in what follows, making it likely that he'd heard first-hand accounts of the action, but equally likely that he played up Grandad's role in events. Anyway, the army moved on past Colonnea and finally arrived at Theodosiopolis. Any of you checking the map will see that the emperor has not only travelled a very long way, but has taken his army at least 150 miles north of Lake Van. The reason being that several of the more direct routes had been so ravaged by Turkic raids that it was feared that they couldn't support such a large force. To make sure that there would be no supply problems, the emperor ordered his entire army to gather two months' worth of rations to take with them south. This caused great distress for the farms around Theodosiopolis, and it slowed the Roman advance further, as flocks of animals were now pushed ahead of the troops down the mountain roads. Huge wagons of logs were also collected in order to build siege weapons. By August, Lake Van was in sight. As we were with Heraclius 440 years ago, we have returned to the high Armenian plateau, about 5,000 feet above sea level. The landscape was one of wide expanses of rolling steppe, with mountains in the distance in every direction. Each patch of arable land was preciously guarded by high-walled cities, which is what made the area so potentially dangerous for visiting armies. In order to combat this problem, Romanus again divided his army in two. He had to consider the logistics of keeping such a large force fed and watered, but he also wanted to prepare the ground for both his sieges. Just ahead of him was Manzikert, which the Byzantines knew well. They'd held it until a few months earlier, and the emperor was confident that he could take it with only half the number of troops at his disposal. He therefore dispatched about half his army south to the lake itself and the country surrounding Cleat. Cleat was the key target, since it guarded the mountain pass as well as the south of the lake. He put this division under the command of Joseph Tachaniotis, and instructed him to make sure that the countryside around Cleat was secured. Don't let the city's garrison destroy crops which the army will need during the siege. The Normans, Pechenegs, and at least half of the Tachmata went to Cleat, leaving the emperor at Manzikert. This is where Romanus's problems began. He was correct about both cities. As we'll see, Manzikert was easy to take, and Cleat's countryside would be key to the successful prosecution of a siege. But the emperor seems to have had no clue that the sultan was, at that very moment, just a day or two away, on the other side of the lake. We left Alp Arslan back in May, outside Aleppo. Upon hearing news of the Roman advance, the sultan quickly abandoned his Syrian campaign and headed north. 
He'd spent the last nine months campaigning to secure the area that the Emperor was targeting. He wasn't about to let all that hard work be wasted. He moved his army so rapidly that allegedly some troops drowned while crossing the Euphrates River. Romanus would have heard about this only in, say, July, when leaving Theodosiopolis. News of a panicked river crossing seems to have convinced the Byzantines that the Sultan's army was in no shape to take them on. The Emperor's military advisers believed that Arslan would need to return to Iraq to gather reinforcements, and seems to have had no clue about his far more direct route north to Lake Van. We can only assume that the breakdown of Roman defences in the mountains had robbed the empire of the scouting network that would normally have informed him of such movements. One has to question, though, whether greater efforts could have been made to discover exactly where the sultan was, given that he commanded the only army within a thousand miles that could threaten Romanus's force. What the Byzantines correctly estimated was that the sultan was outgunned and would not be able to raise 40,000 men to meet them. Arslan raced to the scene, recruiting troops as he went, and dispatched his vizier to gather more cavalry from Azerbaijan. In the end, he may have only had fifteen or 20,000 men with him. What the Byzantines don't seem to have understood is how determined the sultan was to stop them from undoing his work. The Turks didn't need to take on 40,000 Byzantines in order to meet their objectives. Their presence would be enough to deter Romanus from committing himself to a siege. He knew that their speed and ability to shoot from a distance meant he couldn't allow his men to turn their backs on them, and so any kind of effort to blockade Kliad would be impossible. Back at Manzikert, the Emperor's campaign continued to unfold just as he'd imagined it. He personally inspected the city's defences and ordered his Armenian infantry to assault the walls at their weakest point. They did, and seized some towers. The Seljuk garrison offered to surrender if they could leave peacefully. Their offer was accepted, and the Romans occupied the city. Easy peasy. What happened next is still perplexing. The Sultan's steppe cavalry arrived at Kliat. Completely surprised by this, the Roman force under Tachaniotes simply abandoned their positions and retreated with haste along one of the roads that the emperor had avoided using. They headed for the safety of Melitene without informing Romanus of what had happened. Now, maybe riders were sent to tell the Vasilevs, but they were intercepted. Manzikert and Kliat are only 30 miles, 50 kilometers apart, but by slow, winding mountain roads. Maybe riders were sent the long way round to be safe and arrive too late. But, without knowing, it strikes us as bizarre that an army, possibly of about 20,000 men, could retreat so quickly without making more of an effort to consult their commander. Again, it's possible that it all happened too quickly for anyone to do anything to stop it. Certainly the Normans, Pachinegs, and other mercenary troops were not above saving themselves. Maybe a few units panicked and fled, leading to a general rout. Whatever really happened, this ignominious episode denied Romanus the overwhelming numerical superiority he'd enjoyed, and may well have led him to falsely believe that reinforcements were near at hand. At this distance, all we can do is blame the general atrophy in Byzantine military readiness. Even a force as large as this is no good if it lacks coherence, confidence, and experience. It was only the next day, August 25th, when the emperor became aware of the presence of Turkish troops in the area. Units sent out to forage had come back to camp, reporting that nomads were advancing on them in large numbers. Romanos ordered one of his senior commanders, Nicephorus Vrienios, out to drive them off, assuming that they were a small band roaming the countryside. Vrienios headed out with his cavalry and encountered serious resistance. Not only was he shot at by steppe riders, but also attacked directly by other Seljuk troops, 
he quickly withdrew and informed Romanus, who still couldn't believe this was a serious problem. He sent more troops to join Vrienios, but the Turks now backed off, using the feigned retreat to good effect, capturing another sub-commander who chased them too far. Vrienios' grandson tells us that his ancestor came back to camp with spears sticking out of his armour. It could be a fictional anecdote, but it reminds us that the wealthiest Byzantines could survive several direct hits if they were fully kitted out. At this point, the emperor rode out himself with the rest of the army, but by now the advanced scouts of the sultan's force had retreated to a hilltop about ten miles from Manzikert, where they were making camp. Seeing nothing, Romanus returned to his encampment and awaited further news. He didn't have to wait long. It was a moonless evening, and a band of step riders darted through the darkness to make a surprise attack on those lingering outside the Roman camp. I should be clear that despite taking Manzikert, the army had built a fortified camp on the plain outside, and for obvious reasons the 20,000 or so troops were living there rather than burdening the city. The Seljuk Turks came across a group of the mercenary Ogres Turks who were buying supplies from city merchants. The surprise attack caused chaos as men and animals came running into camp, screaming and raising the alarm. The Ogres, who in the twilight looked rather like the enemy, then came riding in at full pelt. For a moment it seemed like the camp was being stormed and chaos nearly became infectious, but the Romans manned the battlements and were able to avoid catastrophe. The victorious nomads rode around and around the camp, screaming their war cries. Scouts now returned, making it clear to the emperor that it was indeed the sultan himself who camped a short ride away with a force that was estimated to be at least comparable to the one the Vasilefs commanded. This was a long night of the soul, if there ever was one. Ataliates asks, For who could get any sleep when danger had drawn its sword and pointed it at us? Romanos must have been bitterly considering his decision to divide the army. At some point, it became clear that no reinforcements were on their way. The presence of the Sultan, though, was both danger and opportunity. Reports suggested that the two sides were relatively evenly matched, and the Turks were clearly ready for a confrontation. Although the Romans no longer had a significant advantage, they still had some elite troops on hand. If they could force the Turks into hand-to-hand -hand fighting, they would surely prevail. A victory over the Sultan would be the kind of victory that secured borders and legitimacy. The emperor had much to consider, but the clock was ticking. When daylight came, the nomads resumed their arrow fire and tried to block the Romans from reaching the nearby river. But the Byzantine infantry took up their bows and arrows and drove them off. As a war council took place, a messenger came in to announce that a group of ogres Turks had just defected to the sultan. Things were getting very tense when a peace embassy arrived. They wanted to discuss terms to create a new treaty between the two sides and to end this day with no bloodshed. Given what happens next, this was probably a genuine offer. Alp Arslan did not want war with Byzantium. He did want to gain control of the heights of Armenia, but beyond that... Conflict with the empire was not in his interests. If the Romans would accept their inferior status and tolerate the inevitable raids that the untamed tribesmen would subject them to, then peace could be had. From the Roman point of view, this was not a position that they could willingly agree to. For Romanus, it would have been political suicide. He had to compete for control of the mountains. Theogenes quite reasonably responded that if the sultan broke camp and retreated to a safer distance, he would be happy to negotiate. The envoys left. There was a huge amount of weight on Romanus's shoulders in this moment. 
To fight the Sultan himself was both opportunity and peril, but peace, which might sound the safer option, was also dangerous. Not only politically, but any kind of retreat was potentially deadly. The speed of the Turks meant that if they reneged on the deal and attacked as the imperial army was gingerly making its way through the mountain passes, disaster would follow. We also have to remember the money that Romanus had spent on this campaign. He had invested a huge portion of the imperial treasury on this expedition. His solvency, as well as his credibility, rested on getting some kind of positive result. Romanus's advisers also suggested that the peace embassy was a delay tactic, designed to allow time for reinforcements to join the Seljuks, at which point the Romans would be doomed. Abruptly, with the peace embassy still reporting their conversation to Alparslan, Romanos gave the signal to form up outside the camp. The Seljuks were taken by surprise and quickly ordered all non-combatants to retreat to the neighbouring foothills. Because of the delay caused by the peace talks, it was now the afternoon, a key detail in what follows. There were four elements to the Roman formation, according to Vrienios's account. Romanus was in the centre, with some cavalry and the heavy infantry. The western Tachmata were on the left wing, under Vrienios. The Anatolian units were on the right wing, under Theodore Aliates. And then there was the rear guard. The rear guard were in place for emergencies, or to cover a retreat and they were commanded by Andronicus Ducas. This was not the 11-year-old son of the previous emperor, but his cousin, as in the adult son of John Ducas, the man who'd most strenuously objected to Romanus's elevation. Presumably, he'd been brought on campaign as a hostage, but also to try and foster better relations with the Ducai, hence handing him this important but not front-rank command. The Romans advanced. There was about eight miles, thirteen kilometres of rolling steppe, grass, outside the city of Manzikert. Beyond that was rocky ground full of gullies leading into the foothills of the nearby mountain. The Seljuk non-combatants, including Alp Arslan himself, retreated to this hill to watch the battle. The steppe archers and Seljuk infantry waited for the Romans across the plain, and as the imperial troops came closer, they retreated before them. This was your classic boxer versus puncher battle. The Romans were the slugger, lurching toward their opponent, keen to get in close and land a knockout blow. If the two sides were thrown together, the more heavily armoured Romans would have the advantage. The Turks were the boxer keeping the Romans always at a distance, throwing constant jabs at them. In this case, the arrows fired from their composite bows. Our two historians agree on the outline of the battle, but differ in their level of detail. Ataliates simply says that Romanos pursued the Seljuks all afternoon before changing tack, while Vrienios says that the steppe riders peppered the wings of the Roman force with arrows, causing a steady trickle of casualties and inciting some to break ranks and chase them with predictable consequences. As the afternoon wore on, Romanus began to fret. He could see that he wasn't going to be able to lock horns with the enemy, and he refused to pursue them over the rougher ground or into the foothills. He also became concerned about the now unguarded imperial camp. Remember that the night before, the surprise attack on the camp had caused chaos. What if some riders outflanked him and reached the baggage train? That was likely to spread panic and lead to a rout. With daylight receding, the emperor gave the signal for the imperial standard to be reversed. This was the signal that the whole army should stop, and begin a steady retreat back to camp. Now, retreating in this situation is not an easy manoeuvre. The key to Roman tactics was to keep in formation, 
In other words, to keep units close enough together to not let gaps open in the lines. You did not want enemy cavalry getting in between the lines and hitting men on their flanks. Gaps inevitably open up after an eight-mile advance, and now the signal had to be sent to units moving at different speeds, with groups of men who spoke different languages. Everyone had to come to a halt at roughly the same point and retreat carefully at the same speed. Even in a confident, coherent, experienced army, this would be tough to coordinate. In this case, it's reported that the wings had become separated from the centre to such an extent that the reversing of the standard was misunderstood by some to mean that the emperor had fallen. Huge gaps now began to appear between the centre and the wings as confused commanders searched for clarification. The gaps were big enough to attract the attention of the sultan and his advisers up on the hill. They now committed their reserve cavalry to the fray, ordering them to lead an attack as swiftly as possible. As you can imagine, what followed was chaotic. The Roman army was already halting, turning, and trying to maintain order amongst thousands of men. And now the sight and sound of the reserve force thundering towards them caused panic. As arrows hit the right wing, it broke apart and began to rout. The rest of the Seljuk army were now turned around and began a full-scale attack on the Byzantine line. The first to be hit was Vrienios's left wing, who also began to come apart. Sensing disaster was about to unfold, Romanos gave the order to turn the standards round again to try and rally his fleeing soldiers, but it was too late. Even parts of the centre began to break off and flee. Just as he'd feared, the Turkish horse archers now outflanked him, leaving the centre isolated and surrounded by the bulk of the Seljuk army. The key now was the army's reserve force. If they marched forward to provide a shield for the retreating soldiers, then the situation might be saved. But both our writers claim that Andronicus Ducas announced to his men that the emperor was dead, turned them around, and marched them away from the battlefield. Allegedly, he didn't take them back to camp, he simply started on the road home, even telling those he encountered to spread word that Theogenes was dead. Back at the camp, Ataliates and the other non-combatants were utterly confused and horrified at what was unfolding. He says, It was like an earthquake, with howling, grief, sudden fear, clouds of dust, and finally, hordes of Turks riding all around. The camp was ransacked as Ataliates and other fortunate survivors fled for the safety of Manzikert. Other troops just hit the road, running pell-mell for cover as the victorious Turks lapped them. Two things prevented this from becoming a slaughter, like the Battle of Yarmouk. One was the timing of the battle. It was now getting dark, and on the treacherous mountain roads, the riders were too scared to pursue the fleeing Byzantines. The other was Romanus. Refusing to give in, the emperor carried on fighting even as the Turks began to return from the imperial camp, surrounding what remained of the center. The emperor's horse was killed from under him. He was wounded in the hand, but continued to resist. Presumably only those fully kitted out in armor survived the onslaught. The Vasilevs continued to fight for a way out, and only the sun's disappearance from the sky and with it the certainty of his men's destruction, did Theogenes give the order to surrender. Various stories are told about Romanos being discovered amongst his men, and Alparslan needing proof that this filthy, exhausted soldier really was the Vasilevs. But it's more likely that the Turks knew all along that that was the Emperor's standard, flailing away in the centre of the force they'd surrounded. Romanos Theogenes became the first Roman Emperor to be captured alive since Valerian back in 260 AD. Though a more recent comparison with this disaster would be the death of Nicephorus I in battle with the Bulgars, Coincidentally, 
260 years earlier. The sense you get when you read about the Battle of Manzikert is that it happened by accident. Heraclius' wars with the Persians were a very direct confrontation between two powers, whereas the Byzantine and Seljuk high commands were not really at war. We saw along the way that had some variable changed just a little, the two sides wouldn't have come face to face. If Romanus had been able to take a more direct route, if Arslan had gone beyond Aleppo, if the imperial army at Cleat had stood its ground. But although the two sides were not trying to destroy one another, they were competing for the same thing. Practically, this was control of the Armenian mountains, but it seems to me that what they both really wanted was security, the feeling that their borders could not easily be violated. This was a particularly important concept for the Romans. When the Arabs drove Heraclius from Syria, Byzantium suffered a very great shock. They went from superpower to beleaguered state in a matter of months. The trauma of that change took a long time to work through. The conquest of the Armenian mountains of Cilicia and Antioch in the 10th century had sealed their healing. They were not just strategic acquisitions, they were psychological ones. Being in charge of the borderlands turned Constantinople and its hinterland into a safe place again. Could Romanus have accepted a peace deal and gone home saying, yes, the raiding will continue, but at least the sultan himself won't invade? I don't think so. Obviously not in his precarious political position. But I think even Basil II, or some other unarguably legitimate monarch, would have fought at Manzikert. Or if not there, then on another day. The Romans could not meekly return to being the house of war. The downtrodden, embattled, chosen people who suffered annually for their sins. Sometime, somewhere, they would have made a stand against the Seljuks, and I suspect that eventually they would have lost. As we saw throughout the centuries of the Caliphate, Byzantium did not have the resources to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with a superpower. If we accept that some kind of defeat was inevitable, we should clarify that the collapse of Roman Anatolia and its settlement by the nomads most definitely was not. This is where the specifics of the Battle of Manzikert and its aftermath become crucial. But we'll get to that. Though it would prove to be a momentous battle, Manzikert was no military calamity. The Battle of Manzikert is often compared to the Battle of Adrianople, that disaster in 378 AD when the Goths destroyed an army, killing the Emperor Valens in the process. Both conflicts saw a foreign enemy let loose into the provinces, and both saw an emperor suffer personally. But at Adrianople, two-thirds of the army were slaughtered. Manzikert was far lighter on Roman casualties. As you know, about half of the 40,000 men that Romanus led into the mountains escaped unscathed before the battle even began. Andronicus Ducas led the reserve force away without a scratch on them, and large numbers of both the right and left wings would have made it to safety under the cover of darkness. It was only in the centre that heavy casualties were suffered from amongst the heavy infantry, some elite cavalry, and the emperor's bodyguard. Ataliates and the troops huddled inside Manzikert were able to escape over the next couple of days. Alp Arslan had a most valuable prisoner to deal with and did not press on to besiege the city immediately. Before we get to that meeting, I think we should have a word about the treachery of Andronicus Ducas. The Ducai, as you can imagine, use Romanus's defeat to discredit him and declare him a public enemy. 
the Dukai themselves will eventually be overthrown, and both our accounts of this battle were written after their downfall. So did Andronicus Ducas really betray the emperor, or was that hindsight blame-sharing? The facts seem to be true. Ducas was in charge of the rear guard, did abandon the field of battle, and did march home. But was this an act of betrayal, self-preservation, or incompetence? It's impossible to know for sure. In the chaos of men retreating, perhaps Ducas himself was confused or misinformed and thought that the sensible thing to do was to protect the men under his command. If it was treachery, then it's hard to know how premeditated the plan was. Did he ever intend to fight? Or did he see Romanus in trouble and seize the opportunity to rid his family of this interloper? Given how irritating and self-serving our historians are, I'm inclined to be sympathetic to Ducas, but those historians are all we have, and they say he abandoned the emperor to his fate, so there's little more I can add. Unusually, we have excellent sources for the meeting between the sultan and the emperor. The Islamic versions were written much later, but agree almost word for word at times, with the Byzantine historians. And we feel confident in their veracity because Romanos will write a letter to his wife after he was released to tell her what had happened. The Sultan was extremely friendly and gracious towards his defeated enemy. He seemed determined to uphold the courteous diplomacy which Roman and Islamic rulers had generally extended to one another across the centuries. Of course, Alp Arslan was in a fine position from which to be magnanimous. He had spent a year now on campaign trying to secure his Byzantine flank in order to be free to deal with rivals within the Islamic sphere. Never did he imagine his efforts to tame the Roman border would bring him such an amazing reward. The most famous exchange between the two men, which the sources report in various ways, can be summarized as the Sultan asking Romanus, What would you have done with me if our positions were reversed? The Emperor, believing in this instance that honesty was the best policy, replied, I would have killed you, cruelly. The Sultan responded that he would not be sinking to that level. Instead, he offered to return Romanus to his people with an escort, slaves, and any prisoners he wanted freed. In exchange, all he wanted was that peace treaty. This doubtless would have involved the payment of an annual tribute, the abandonment of Manzikert and various other border fortresses, possibly a marriage alliance. But whether Romanus would have honoured the agreement, we'll never know. It's doubtful whether the Sultan cared either way. He could now send men to retake Manzikert at his leisure, and if the Romans reneged on the deal, then he had license to invade their territory whenever he pleased. A more interesting question is whether the Sultan believed that by releasing Romanus, he would do more damage to Byzantium than if he executed him. If he foresaw the chaos and civil war that this move would bring, then it was a stroke of genius. The two men supposedly embraced eight days later as they said their goodbyes. Romanos set out on the road to Theodosiopolis, dressed in the clothing of a Seljuk nobleman. Alp Arslan headed east, his reputation burnished by this most statesmanlike act of mercy. Back in Constantinople, confusion reigned. The first reports from the east were not at all clear. Some said the emperor was dead, some said he'd been taken prisoner, others said they didn't know. In a sense, there was no need to panic. Evthokia could continue to administer the realm while her son Michael was now in his early twenties and had long ago been crowned emperor. But once they had a clear picture of what had happened, the regime decided to act presumably to distance themselves from the defeat and to prevent the Roman emperor from becoming a Seljuk puppet, they declared Romanus deposed. About six weeks later, a letter for the empress from her husband arrived. 
detailing his misfortune and his kind treatment by the sultan. Presumably in it, Romanos indicated that he was well and was ready to resume his duties. Fearful that the mother of his children would have her head turned by this, the men of the Ducas family stepped in. The Caesar John and his sons went to work on Michael and convinced him to have his mother exiled. She was packed off to a convent, while Michael the Seventh was declared sole emperor. Again, Pselos leaves us with a confusing portrayal of young Michael. He says he was so diffident that he would rather abdicate than actually confront his mother, which is presented as praise, but is clearly criticism. And then he shields Michael from blame for his mother's exile, saying that his uncle and cousins acted against his will. Certainly John's family were now in the driving seat, and they had to act quickly. Romanus had refused to do the decent thing and die. They had a civil war to prepare for. Again, at the heart of Roman crises, we find the never-ending dispute over succession. The problem that many men foresaw in Romanus's elevation had come to pass. He and the Ducas clan would now use state resources to battle over the throne at the very moment when Byzantine resources were stretched thinnest. This was not to be a quick and easy affair. Often in these situations, the usurping figure out in the provinces struggles to maintain their support when faced with a hostile palace. But Romanus was in a different position. He had been, and was still, in the eyes of many, emperor. A lot of the men serving in the east had been appointed by him, even though they now risked the wrath of the court, several high-profile figures stood by their Vasilevs. When he arrived at Theodosiopolis, Romanus was greeted by many of the men who'd made their way back along that route from Manzikert. He led them west where he heard the news that he was now an enemy of the state. He began collecting taxes in the Armenia Con and made contact with Theodore Aliates, the commander of the right wing at Manzikert, who brought his troops to his master's side. Meanwhile, the Ducai entrusted their remaining soldiers to John's younger son, Constantine, who moved around northwest Anatolia, collecting taxes to pay his men. Note that carefully. Constantinople no longer had the money on hand to pay its soldiers. Romanus had drained the treasury for his campaign. Now money was being squeezed from the countryside to pay for a war that would only kill Romans. You might think that the Ducai would wait Romanus out, but they knew that Theogenes was still popular with the army. If they let him march around Anatolia, he might become unstoppable. Constantine Ducas advanced to Amasia to confront him. With him he'd brought the former commander of the empire's Norman mercenaries, Roger Crepin. Not only was Crepin an experienced and ruthless general, but he'd been imprisoned by Romanos, so bore a healthy grudge. Perhaps because of his wounds, or the trauma of Manzikert, Romanos did not personally fight in the battle that followed. Instead, Aliates led his forces to an unfortunate defeat. Again, Crepin proved too adept for his less experienced opponents. Aliates was captured in the rout and blinded for his treason. Romanos moved south through his ancestral home of Cappadocia and down into Cilicia. There, another of his appointees, the Dukes of Antioch, Chatatorius, hailed him as emperor and promised him aid. The two set up base in Cilicia for the winter, and meanwhile, back in Constantinople, the knives were out for those suspected of harbouring sympathy for Romanos. First on the list were the Komnenos clan, several of whom were sent into exile. During the course of the winter, the Dukai sent ambassadors to negotiate with Theogenes. Maybe there was a way this could be ended peacefully. But he still believed he could fight his way out and refused. 
in spring, Andronicus and Crepin moved on Cilicia. The Norman was the acting commander of imperial forces, another ominous sign of things to come. We have to question the competence of Chattatorius, who apparently did not block the mountain passes into Cilicia, allowing the imperial army to meet him in the fields outside Tarsos. Again, Romanus's lieutenant fought for him and lost. More Roman soldiers fell, fighting amongst themselves. Theogenes was stranded in the city of Adana. He made rather desperate attempts to find aid from the Seljuks and then from Crepin himself, but the Normans stood firm until Romanus's food ran out. He offered to abdicate and take holy orders, and made sure that he exited the city in monastic garb, flanked by three bishops who'd been brought in to help make the deal. Ducas's soldiers treated the former Vasilefs well as they led him across Anatolia, back towards the Bosphorus. But, as they reached the edge of the plateau in late June, orders arrived from the court. The deal was to be broken, and Theogenes blinded. Again, Selos protects his pupil Michael from blame, saying that the order was given against his wishes. But the Machiavellian Selos admits that he thought it absolutely necessary to avoid further trouble. And he was probably right about that. Still, it's impossible not to feel sorry for Romanos. Ataliates lays it on thick, describing the weeping emperor begging the bishops to intervene and describing the horrible job that was done with his blinding. Romanus's wounds would become infected, and he died about a month later in exile on one of the prince's islands. He was in his late thirties. He had spent his four-year reign campaigning in the borderlands, the only emperor since Basil II to do so. Because of the neglect of other people, he faced impossible odds. He did his best. He ultimately failed. But his contemporaries believed that he was repeatedly betrayed by those who feared that he might succeed. Free of the Ducas regime some seven years later, Ataliates published his history and let Michael VII have it with both barrels. What do you have to say, O Emperor, you and those who crafted this unholy decision? The eyes of a man who had done no wrong, but risked his life for the welfare of the Romans. He could have waited it out in the palace, without any danger, and shrugged off the toils and horrors of the military life. As for you, O Emperor, what was this order that you gave? Who exactly was to be deprived of light itself? This man, who behaved towards you as a father, who set aside imperial power and yielded it to you, who replaced the imperial purple for rags, who was ill and helpless, who had need of healing treatment and comfort, who had renounced everything and was sick and oppressed with misfortune, who was a broken reed and wasted away by streams of tears running down his face? You, nevertheless, will give in to your rage, your frenzied and insatiable lust to rule, and show no respect either for his monastic status or for your mother's breast, which you shared with his sons, your brothers. One way or another, a day will come when an evil eye, titanic and cronian, will turn its gaze upon you and push your fortunes to the same evil fate. Given their position, the Ducai would have been foolish to allow Romanos to keep his sight. But Ataliates' furious hindsight does give us a sense of the feelings which Manzikert had aroused. A debate over who was to blame seems to have raged for the next decade, and Theogenes became a deeply sympathetic figure in the Byzantine imagination. His wife... Evthokia, was given permission to travel so that she could oversee his funeral. <laughs> 
That is what was so damaging about Manzikert. Our narrative this century has been a desperate battle for legitimacy. Everyone felt the chill of standing in Basil II's shadow. But now, it was as if all legitimacy was spent. The Ducai were in power, but they were despised by many. Romanus's generals started making plots to overthrow them, but each was damaged by their involvement in the humiliation of Manzikert. Roman arms themselves were completely discredited. Norman mercenaries had led the charge against the remnants of Romanus's army, and in the civil wars which follow it will be them and Turkic tribesmen who are hired to lead the battles of the never-ending succession crisis which Byzantium had fallen into. One short-sighted decision after another had led to this moment, and now that boulder has started to pick up steam. It's worth noting that the Seljuks maintained their side of the bargain during 1071. No raids came into Anatolia while the Romans were busy killing one another. But the death of Romanos meant the peace treaty died with him. Although it's doubtful, as we've seen already, that the nomads would have cared much about such legal niceties. Seljuk High Command, though, left Byzantium alone. They now controlled the major routes through Armenia and northern Mesopotamia, which is all they wanted. Alparslan rushed away from Manzikert to deal with much more pressing priorities. Trouble was brewing in the east, where more steppe tribes were crossing the Oxus River and fighting for the Sultan's rivals. The valiant lion's determination to look his defeated rivals in the eye allegedly got the better of him. Four months after Theogenes passed away, Arslan was stabbed to death by a captured governor who he'd brought into his presence. Manzikert may be the end of an era, but it's not the end of our narrative century. The civil war, sparked by Romanus' defeat, is only the first of many. The next decade will see the Romans tear themselves thoroughly apart, inviting the nomads to join in. It's going to be an extremely bumpy ride. If you'd like to remind yourself of better times, then check out the History Time YouTube channel. Not only can you find good videos on all sorts of Roman topics, but a new one has just launched about the career of Nicephorus Focus. Go to YouTube and put in History Time or search for Nicephorus Focus Pale Death of the Saracens. <laughs>